Welcome to FRC Media News for Thursday, November 3rd, 2016. I'm Keith Tebow. Tonight we wrap up our series on the four ballot questions that will appear on Tuesday's ballot, looking at question two, charter school expansion. We'll give you an update on the state's new early voting program, especially here in Fall River. And we hit the streets to get the people's view on who they feel should be our next president. But first, we will check in with the news headlines of the week and bring in for the Herald News Digital News Editor, Will Richmond. Will, how are you? I'm good, Keith. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, thankfully, one more week. This week, next time, next week, this time, we'll be talking about the results of the election. And let me first uh, ask you, uh, Will, um, what are you guys going to be doing in terms of uh, election day? What are you, what are you going to be doing at the Herald News in terms of covering the election here in Fall River in this region? Yeah, sure. It's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a. I don't know if sleepy is the right term for our area, though it's a little, you know, we don't have the local races that we have in past years. So we're going to have reporters fanned out across uh, the coverage area throughout Greater Fall River to collect results, talk to voters about their choice for president. Uh, we'll also have a reporter embedded with the, uh, the folks down in Tiverton uh, that are hopefully, uh, we'll be hoping to celebrate the victory for uh approval of a, the construction of a casino in, in Tiverton right across the far line. So, um, so yeah, we're going to have everyone spread out and kind of reporting back um, with a focus on giving our readers uh, full coverage of local results, including how the area voted on the president uh, issue and uh, as well as the ballot questions. And, uh, and pretty much that will be our focus on Tuesday. Yeah, I know it's sort of uh, different. We've had a lot of uh, contentious local elections in years past, even on the off year like this is in terms of not having a city election. Uh, we had two years ago, we did have a, a recall uh, election in December. So it's somewhat good to be a little quiet locally, but of course everything is focused on the top of the ticket and we'll have more on that next week. Let's focus back here to the city of Fall River. This week, the City Council Finance Committee met on Tuesday night with members of the administration and the uh, park commissioners to uh, discuss uh, the goings on at the uh, city cemeteries, Oak Grove in particular, where and we've talked about this in the past, Will, the, the uh, regulations in terms of what has been now the removal of some not only decorative items on, on uh, tombstones and on sites in the cemetery, but also some decorative urns as well. And a number of people were there to uh, shed their their complaints and share their complaints with the city council yeah certainly the the members of the public and those affected by the removal of the items at oak grove uh remain very unhappy with those actions uh it doesn't seem that there's any real clear answer for why these this sort of second phase of of items being removed happened uh beyond some complaints that cemetery employees were finding their wheels were getting stuck on some things um, but, you know, there seemed to be a, you know, th this removal came months after the removal of items in the spring mm -hmm. after that whole situation. So it, it seemed that Tuesday night sort of served as the opportunity for the city council to voice their displeasure, as well as give uh, those affected by the, the removals a, another opportunity to voice their concerns about it. Um, so certainly the, the parks board is serves more at the uh, the whim of the mayor than the city council so the city council can certainly make their suggestions but uh you know in terms of taking orders from the council that uh, right. that's not exactly the the prerogative of the park board right it was more of a hearing for uh the city councils to hear from residents about the uh, the instances at the uh, oak grove cemetery this week uh, mayor career also announced a new interim director of cemeteries john perry who had served as a uh, manager in the DPW uh, department here in, uh, in Fall River. Uh, was he at the meeting the other day, and, and did he have anything to say about uh, what he may do as, as director? Or obviously he works at, as you said, at the, uh, at the pleasure of not only the mayor, but also takes its guidance from the park commissioner. Right, well, uh, based on our report, the focus was mainly on the comments of the city councilors yeah. and uh, and those people who had items removed from the grave, the grave sites. Uh, so he may have been there more of an, in a listening capacity, certainly. Uh, he had only been formally announced in, in that interim position the day before, so maybe there's, there may be a bit of a catch-up period for him uh, 
to hear these complaints as well and hear them in a more detailed fashion than, you know, sort of as they may have been relayed to him through the mayor's office. Um, it was also expected that the uh, more recently hired DCM director was going to be in attendance as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also he'll he's expected to serve in the, as a sort of informational conduit to the parks board on this issue as well going forward. All right, and uh, the parks commission is uh, not slated to hold another meeting until sometime next month in December. So we'll be uh, following along, I'm sure, at that time. Hopefully they'll also um, hear about uh, some of these complaints. I'm sure they have, but in a more formal setting amongst uh, their, their meetings. And uh, we'll see what happens as, as this goes forward. The uh, King Philip Mill back in the news again this week, Will, as uh, the uh, RFP out in terms of what uh, will be done with the future of that site. The city is still looking to demolish a good portion of the mill, but it was brought up this week that um, depending on what is demolished, it may jeopardize the uh, placement of the mill site, uh, the National Historic Register, which means those who are bidding to do work and to develop that site may miss out on some tax credits. Can you explain that? Yes, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, bids were expected to be open this month mm -hmm. on uh, those who were looking to put in a uh, request for proposals on the site. But as you mentioned, that has now been pushed back as the question has been raised as if a demol demolition of any portion of the site could result in the loss of the historical uh, status. Um, that may change as well the uh, sort of interest of any potential developers who may have felt you know, that the option of receiving historical credits and the tax credits that come with it uh, would make it more of an attractive redevelopment site without those credits. Uh, you know, that certainly puts the burden on the developer to fund any uh, improvements and redevelopment there. So that process has now been pushed back to December. Um, hopefully, I think we've seen as with this, uh, with the King Philip Mill, that this has been an ongoing problem for mm. quite some time. So December is the latest target date uh, that we'll wait to see if uh, anything moves forward on. All right, Will, um, other than I'm sure more pre-election coverage, what's coming up uh, at the paper over the next few days? More pre-election coverage. There you go. <laughs> um, Done. Yeah, no, we'll be we'll really be wrapping up, uh, giving everyone their sort of last view on uh, the local on any local candidates. We'll be previewing the congressional races right. for the 4th District and, or the 4th Congressional District and the 9th Congressional District, as well as uh, one of the races that happens out in part of Swansea. And then on Monday, we'll offer some quick hit uh, informational pieces on the ballot questions and hopefully get everybody ready to go out to the polls on Tuesday if they haven't voted already through the uh, early voting period. Well, I'm sure you'll have your popcorn ready on Tuesday night as we'll all be watching the election results come in specifically on, uh, on the race for president. All right, Will, thanks. We'll talk again next week. All right, have a good weekend, Keith. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot job list from the Fall River Career Center. Medical Receptionist, Primacare Health Care Services located at 277 Pleasant Street, is now hiring for a full-time experienced medical receptionist to attend to patients on the phone and in person. Knowledge of healthcare insurance, medical terminology, procedures and diagnosis, as well as relevant computer software applications. Job number 808-3563. Cook, Genesis Healthcare is looking for a full-time cook at the Somerset Ridge Center facility located at 455 Brayton Avenue in Somerset, Massachusetts. The cook is responsible for preparing and cooking a wide variety of food for customers, employees, and visitors. Must have experience in institutional food handling and able to work a flexible schedule. Job number 799-7920. Teaching Coordinator. Collaborative for Educational Services located at 555 Eastern Avenue has an immediate opening for a teaching coordinator to provide educational program leadership and instruction to adolescents placed in residential programs run by the Department of Youth Services. Job number 808 0169. Amazon is looking to fulfill part-time and full-time positions at the Amazon Fulfillment Center in Fall River. 
Senior Regional Engineer, job number 800-9382. Construction Manager, job number 800-9388. Field Transportation Lead, job number 809-1096. For more information on these or other positions, visit frcmedianews.org or call the Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. continue our discussion of the state ballot initiatives facing Massachusetts voters on November 8th. Today we look at question two, charter school expansion. If passed, question two would allow for up to 12 approvals each year of either new charter schools or expanded enrollment in existing charter schools, but not to exceed 1% of the statewide public school enrollment. Joining me now to speak in support of question two is our local state senator, Michael Rogers. Senator Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm well. Thank Hi. you. It's always great to be here. Why should people vote yes on question two? Um, I feel very strongly uh, that uh, when it comes to education, one size does not fit all. And that parents uh, should have the opportunity to choose the best educational model for their child. Um, and regardless of your financial wherewithal, Certainly we know if uh, you have the money, uh, you can afford private school or parochial school, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the money, you really don't have a choice. So over 20 years ago, uh, the Massachusetts legislature passed education reform, so-called Chapter 70, uh, which created public charter schools. Since then, they have proven to be very, very effective, um, providing a choice for all parents when it comes to public education. And regardless if you live in the Highlands or the Flint, or in Maplewood or in Corky Row, you should, as a parent, have the ability to choose what's the best educational model for your mm -hmm. child. Now, the big issue that those opposed to question two are saying is that this will siphon funds from the public school system into these charter schools. I know those on the proponent side are saying that's not the case. Let me ask you, what is the case? It's absolutely not the case. And whether or not it siphons money, charter public schools siphon money from the traditional public schools um, is a quantitative debatable point. Mm -hmm. Do the math, do the arithmetic. People have done the math and done the arithmetic. The Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation just came out with a report last week that unequivocally says that charter public schools do not drain the money from traditional public schools. And uh, anyone that follows politics like you do knows that the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald rarely agree on anything, <laughs> right? The Boston right. Globe is a left-leaning, more progressive newspaper, probably more closely aligned with Democratic Party principles. The Boston Herald is a right-leaning, more conservative newspaper, more aligned with Republican Party principles. They both editorialized in full support uh, of charter schools, and, um, you know, the money follows the child. These, we're not talking about, you know, uh, what's best for school systems. We're talking what's best for our students. Mm -hmm. The money follows the child. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, the case being made about um, choice? You mentioned it before that this will give uh, parents and, and their children an opportunity to choose a, a school yep. uh, that may fit <coughs> their needs better. Yep. Um, some in opposition will say, well, in some locales, they can pick a school within their district. So what's the difference? The difference really is the educational model. Mm -hmm. Charter schools um, have different models uh, than traditional public schools. There are longer school days. There are longer school years. There's much more discipline uh, in the charter schools. Um, charter schools oftentimes require uniforms to be worn. So it's really a choice. Do you want to choose a school? that does have a longer school day, that does have a longer school year, that might have a more strict uh, discipline code um, than what our traditional public schools offer. If that's the case, then you would choose a charter school. If that's not the case, then you can s choose a school choice within your district um, um, if, if the district offers that. Mm -hmm. Now, some in, in the opposition will also say this is sort of an indictment against the public school system. Um, you know, not only financially, but also in terms of the quality of our public school education. No, absolutely not. Our traditional public schools are improving drastically. Right here in Fall River, our schools are improving. We saw the Cuss Middle School go from a level four to a level one school with a lot of hard work. 
uh, instituting a lot of new principles, mm -hmm. not principles school leaders, but right. principles and methods of education, many of which are modeled after the charter public schools, like longer school day, extended learning time. Um, one size doesn't fit all. We know we have, uh, when, when you get to high school, for instance, there are choices. Mm -hmm. You can choose traditional comprehensive high school like we have at Durfee High School, or you can choose a vocational technical high school like mm -hmm. we have at, at Diamond Voke and Bristol Aggie. Um, because all kids are different. All kids have different needs, different desires, uh, different um, ways of learning mm -hmm. and who's best to decide than the parents of what yeah. is the best choice of educational model for their child. Senator Rogers, thank you very much. I you're, appreciate the time. You're, you're very welcome. Thank Joining you us so now much. in opposition to question two on the Massachusetts ballot, the expansion of charter schools. I'm joined by former school committee member Paul Coogan. Paul, thank you for joining us. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, Paul, why should people vote no on question two? Um, People should vote no on question two because it's an open-ended question which allows for the expansion of 12 s charter schools a year for infinity. We haven't met the existing cap statewide on charter schools. So at this time, I don't believe there's a reason to add more to the mix. Um, a number of reasons that I think charter schools, the cap should stay where it is right now, um, is because in Fall River, we have two charter schools. I'm not even uh, sure if we can sustain another one right now with the local money that leaves us to go to the charter schools. Right now, Fall River is spending $12 million, I believe, this year on charter schools. Mm -hmm. And I know that if you watch the ads and they're slick and they say more money for uh, public education, they're correct. But it does not say more money for public schools. The Fall River Public Schools, which I ran uh, for the school committee to represent, has, uh, as a member of the school committee, we have local control, democratically elected people to oversee our schools. I don't know who's running the charter schools. I don't know who's on those boards. I don't know how you get in touch with them. I don't yeah. really know how it is. In Fall River, we go around and we run citywide and we campaign and we listen to what the people have to say. We get phone calls at home all the time and people tell us goods and bads about the Fall Post schools and there's right. some local accountability. Right. Now, in terms of, you, you mentioned about the dollars. Um, it's funny looking at the pros and cons of question two. Those in favor of it says, as you say, that there will be more money for public schools. Those against it say it's taking money away from public schools. Who's right? Okay. Charter schools are actually private corporations running as a public school. If it says more money for public schools, they mean a privately controlled charter school. Okay. Public schools, as I see them, are the Fall River school system. You go to, um, let's say for example, simple, simple thing. Somebody moves here from Ohio to go to work for Amazon. They live across the street from uh, the Atlantis Charter School, um, which is a public school. Right. They can't enroll their, ch their child in that school. You come to the Fall River Public Schools and you live near Viveris or you live near Sylvia, and we're going to admit you into the public schools. You're, our admission process is registration and records. Other than some egregious felonies or something, we admit all students. Mm -hmm. They have waiting lists. They have closed admission periods. Uh, a, to me, a public school is a public school. You walk in, you register, you're a member of that community. If you're telling me that I'm going to move here from Ohio to put my child on a wait list because I can see the school down the street, I don't know if that's a real public school. Now, the, the, those in support also say that it provides uh, school choice. Is that something that well, is it, not the case? or It provides school choice for the people that win the lottery. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking, I mean, I, and, and I do have to stress this. I'm not against charter schools per se. I think that they've uh, done some good things. Um, my brother, who worked for the Forbes School System, left, and he's working for a charter school. So that's not the issue. School choice is a choice for all people. Mm -hmm. It's not a choice for the select few that get in. The choice for going to a charter school is, is drawn by some formula or whatever they do to select students. Our choice as the Florida Public Schools is registration, let's get you placed, let's mm -hmm. get you up and running. Those schools can't, can't and don't operate like that. 
Paul, we're out of time. Thank oh. you for your time. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me in. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. I have with me here Bruiser. He's a 13-year-old Dosh Hound. So he's a little bit of an old guy for shelter life. So it would be great if somebody could come down, take a look at him, take him home. And despite the fact that he's 13, he still has a lot of energy. You can see he still moves around quite well. He's pretty playful with, uh, with toys and really just people in general. Likes a good scratch. He would, I should mention he'd be great for the Senior for Senior program, so if you're 55 or older, you, the, his adoption fee would just be $25. And as you can see, he'd make a good little companion. Hi, meet Druid. Druid is about five years old, but he looks a lot older. He needs a surgery for his eyes because he has what's called entropion, and we're looking to see to get that done. And uh, basically what that is, is his eyelashes are touching his eyes and aggravating them. So he keeps his eyes squinted a lot. We usually have a lot of good success with entropion surgery. We don't do that here, but we have excellent doctors who do that for us. And um, they can see their eyes stop running, stop getting infected. He looks, looks and acts like an old man, but he's not. But he's a happy boy, cuddly, lovable accepts whatever you give to him. So if you want to meet Druid, you can come to Forever Paws. We're at 300 Linwood Street in Fall River. We're open 11 to 4 every day, including Saturday and Sunday, except for Wednesday. Welcome back. Massachusetts, for the first time, has implemented early voting whereby residents can cast their ballots in advance of the November 8th election. Fall River Board of Elections Chairperson Liz Kamara tells FRC Media News she had some hesitation about the program at the beginning, but now thinks the option to vote early has prompted more registered voters to participate in what she expects to be a high voter turnout election year. Well, the early voting it will be held for these two weeks, ending November 4th on a Friday. And people can come in and cast their vote before November 8th. They won't be tallied. They won't be tallied until November 8th. But it gives people an opportunity to come out and vote if that day of November 8th was hard for them to get out and do so. Uh, so early voting is available to every registered voter. It's similar to the absentee voting, except absentee voting, you need to have the excuse as to why you're not voting on election day. But this is opened up to everyone, every voter. To date, there are over 2,700 Fall River voters who've already cast ballots in this year's election out of over 50,000 registered here in Fall River. FRC Media News hit the streets in downtown Fall River this week to get opinions on this year's contentious presidential race. Rhode Island resident Marcel Boucher, doing business in the city on that day, is not impressed with either Republican candidate Donald Trump or his Democratic candidate rival Hillary Clinton. I wish that the two candidates, instead of mudslinging, would talk more about what they can do for this country to move it forward and actually stay away from the mudslinging. That's my opinion opinion on that. Now, did you form an opinion of who you'd like to vote for? Not yet. I think it's going to be a game time decision. I watched all three debates and was hoping that I could see something from some come out of something, but there's so much mudslinging. I want to know what they can do to help this country move for four more years and not just attack other people, I guess. I just didn't like that part of it, I guess. And finally, congratulations go out to the Bristol Community College men's soccer team, which is celebrating its NJCAA Region 21 Division III Championship. The Bayhawks hosted the regional tournament last weekend at Durfee High School. After defeating Springfield Tech in the semifinals, the Bayhawks edged Bunker Hill Community College 4-3 on a late penalty kick in Sunday's championship game. Next week, BCC will be the seventh seed as it takes part in the NJCAA Division III Championships in upstate New York. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. You can catch FRC Media News Thursday and Friday at 6 p.m. 
but we're online 24-7 at frcmedianews.org. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Thursday.